today's lecture is the last lecture. In this lecture, I am not supposed to tell you something new, I am not supposed to tell you something uh, very difficult or advanced. As a tradition of NPTEL lectures, I am supposed to summarize what has been done, give you an overview of what is the subject in some sense and give an idea of what you can probably do with it. It is also important that I uh, give you some possibly more homeworks or little bit of examples if possible, tell you about what has not been done, what I wanted to do because as you know there is number of lectures which is fixed. It is also important to know that whatever I have done here may not be the most important things needed by each and every one of you who are listening to this lectures. Because uh, there is a lot of things in optimization and every, every practitioner needs something of it. I really wanted to tell you something about direct search methods in the sense that uh, these are heuristic methods which takes a point for example, I am giving you a compass search which is called and look at a point x naught and see if the gradient uh, is 0 at, at this point. So, this for a different uh, or does not matter ok. Even if you have a gradient information you can do it without gradient information. Suppose this point is not the optimum. So, you check for few points. So, you move along this direction move along this move along this move along this east west north south and see at which point function value is decreased take that point. If I have not decreased the function value right function value remains higher than this then I have to reduce my radius of the movement and then again try. So, these are called uh, one of the methods or one of the direct search methods. These things appeared in the mid 60s, but they did not have a convergence proof. So, lost their cloud with the mathematicians and they were almost forgotten though and though later revived that if you have differentiability information for this sort of cases you can actually develop a convergence tool. I really wanted to do something with that in this course, but okay, this is not the time that you can actually do such things in the, in the last lecture. You recollect in this course we have started with unconstrained optimization. Of course, unconstrained optimization is a mirror through which all of optimization can be viewed. So, the fundamental rule to find here is to find an x naught and then check if. is positive definite is P D. So, if you, if you can find an x naught which satisfies this and this then such an x naught is it will imply that x naught is minimum that is exactly what is the thing that we learn. And of course, we learn through various algorithms how to find um, not exactly the minimum, but find some sort of a good approximation to it because it is 
very important to know except for toy examples which we give in books like f x equal to x square. In actual problems or even slightly complicated problems a fact which I am I want to stress I am stressing rather in this course is that you cannot find the actual solution to an optimization problem. What you can find is some sort of a approximate solution a happy solution which you may like which you may not like so it is up to you. So, so x naught is the minimum. So, x naught is the minimum here theoretically, but x naught to find to use algorithms. So, algorithms give only approximations. So, this is a fundamental thing you must remember algorithms give approximations. Not possible to not easy. Or rather, or rather impossible in most cases. An exact solution. So, this is a fact that you need to remember when you want to if you want to advance yourself in this subject of optimization. Now, the algorithms that we did were largely steepest descent. We spoke about the Newton's method. We spoke about conjugate gradient method. I want you to recollect that these two are line search methods. That means this can be written as. where d k is a direction of descent and you know what is the direction of descent. Here it is slightly different here we are talking about the conjugate directions. So, this is built upon conjugate directions. So, there is another non line search algorithm called trust region algorithms which we had not done. So, another important class at this moment and a very important part of optimization research is trust region algorithms. So, I would refer you to the book by Noseh Allen Wright which because it also has an Indian edition which is published by Springer numerical optimization Jorge Nasadal and Stephen Wright. So, so you can see a very very good uh, study of fundamental issues in trust region algorithms using this. We also did another important variation of the Newton's method which is much more useful to solve non convex problems is the quasi Newton methods. A 
of course you must remember that when we do the line search methods we always have to keep in mind that we are expecting this we want to do this. There is a interesting uh, analogy between trust region algorithms and quasi Newton algorithms, because in trust region algorithms need the use of constraint optimization, while this also needs the use of constraint optimization to understand it to make its updates. Well, this and this and this really does not need it. So, now once uh, unconstrained optimization was done, we came to the heart of the matter, we came to study the constraint optimization problems, where we studied the Fritjohn conditions. and the Karush Kuntakar conditions. I would like to revise your memory in the sense that a very important thing is to note that whenever there is a normal multiplier for a Fritjohn system that is same as telling the that the Karush Kuntagar condition sold. So, every normal multiplier existence of every normal multiplier is telling that the Karush Kuntagar condition holds. So, there were constant qualifications like the linear independence constant qualification on LICQ or the Mangasarian from which Mangasarian from which constant qualification which it is called the MFCQ, these two always guarantee that if this is satisfied at the solution point, then there cannot be any Fritjohn multiplier which is abnormal. All the Fritjohn multipliers would have lambda not strictly bigger than 0. I would just uh, remind you the Karush Kuntagar conditions. So, let me take one constraint equality and one constraint inequality. So, this is the FJ condition or the Fritjohn condition. So, what is done here if you observe the last second condition is a very important thing to note here that if LICQ or MFCQ is holding as we have said that there cannot be any lambda naught which is strictly bigger than 0. See I have to write this also lambda sorry lambda 1 g 1 x is star equal to 0. this is called the complementary slackness condition. Now, if these two any of this to happen then this can never be 0. Actually in the Fritjohn condition what we have is that lambda naught, lambda 1 and mu 1 this is not equal to 0. So, lambda naught is either 1 and 1 means either greater than 0 or lambda naught is equal to 0. If lambda naught is equal to 0 we can always uh, rescale the multipliers with lambda naught that is divide by lambda naught and get this lambda naught to be equal to 1. So, I can always uh, write as this as now you see uh, this thing is guaranteed to be always strictly greater than zero if this either this happens or this happens. This is the weakest condition which guarantees that all the lambda knots are strictly bigger than zero. If this fails, then they it will be always confirmed that lambda naught is strictly bigger than 0. Sorry, lambda naught, uh, sorry, I just uh, want to repeat. 
if this MFCQ fails then there is always a set of multipliers which satisfy this with lambda not equal to 0 that will there exist an abnormal multiplier. So a very very important central thing in your learning is this if MFCQ fails there exists an abnormal multiplier abnormal FJ multiplier fridge zone multiplier. So when MFCQ fails your abnormal multiplier is guaranteed. So if all the conditions that you will see in books like Abedi constant qualification or Gignard constant qualification or the approach of Arutini of in the recent times they only do one thing they say that okay, if my MFCQ has failed my problem is an abnormal problem because of an abnormal multiplier but then does there exist a set of multipliers which is normal that is with lambda not strictly bigger than 0. The answer surprisingly turns out to be yes. So these uh, conditions guarantee that there will be at least one multiplier set with lambda not strictly greater than 0. So the KKD condition would be satisfied that is why these are uh, these uh, things which are weaker than MFCQ are called constraint qualifications because if the constraints qualify those conditions then the KKT condition is guaranteed. A very very central issue is in linear programming. For a linear programming problem there always exists a Karush Kuntagar point or they are without any constant qualifications. So this is a very very important result for an LP this is, this is called an LP an LP for an LP rather for a LP we can always guarantee always guarantee the existence of a normal John multiplier. The interesting part is that if I take it this to be any other function f x it's a differential function non convex also. Then if these constants are linear you can still write down the Karush Kuntagar condition without any use of constant qualification that if actually I have linear or affine constants then the existence of at least one normal Fritz John multiplier is guaranteed this is a central thing very very important result the, the the interior point methods which not the Karmakar's one which has occurred after that especially through the work of Renegard the use of uh, Newton's method for solving uh, the use of uh, Newton's method for solving this uh, problem this linear programming problem comes out of this very fact that the Karush Kuntar condition always exists that is always there is one set of multipliers which is normal. So the KKT condition is always holding and then we can just solve the KKT system very cleverly using the Newton's method which we do not discuss here but it is discussed in slight details in my other course on convex optimization in NPTEL. So this is a very very important very very central fact and this cannot be ignored this is a very very important fact possibly in the Karush theory this is the central fact I would say. Now we have also discussed something about and we had done some lot of examples another book that I want to show you which is a Springer text in 
uh, statistics series book. This is the optimization by Kenneth Lang. It is available in Indian edition. But the usefulness of uh, this is that not only it has the Indian edition because this book is written by a statistician who uses optimization in his work and so you can see a lot of good examples from statistics and that is really a source of fun even for the optimizer to read this book it is really a big fun I would say. Has a very different way of looking at Karush Kuntakar theory and so, so the thing one should read it. Read it. So, let me just uh, try to give you a type of problem that is useful in statistics and maybe you should be able to find the x the solution. So, you let me want to minimize f x Now, you observe that this is only defined if I have x i strictly bigger than 0 x i not equal to 0 rather not bigger than 0 and I have an upper half space this constraint. So, is called a minimum of the linear reciprocal function x i cannot be equal to 0. So, once x i is not equal to 0 this is a differentiable function. So, now find find the kkd point. and check if that is a minimum. So, here is an example where you have to use the Lagrangian theory. Now, if you look at this problem I remind you again that okay, once you have this kkd point how do you check that it is a minimum you can always check the second order conditions. Just remember the second order conditions that we have discussed and you can check the second order conditions here and see what you get out of it or whether you can argue in some other way that this is actually a minimum that would be much more fun. So, there are many many things that we have studied for example, we have studied the penalty method penalty approach. We have spoken about exact penalty. We have spoken about the projected gradient method and the projected subgradient method. We have spoken about projected gradient method. and projected subgradient method. We have also studied in quite a detail about Lagrangian duality. Now, I will just write to you as a homework about one problem which you will see that Lagrangian dual you start studying the Lagrangian dual of such a problem is actually very helpful. These are called pro problems which can be decomposed uh, or decomposable problems and so let me write down a problem let me write down its structure and you will see that Lagrangian right, studying the Lagrangian dual of such a problem is more useful or simpler in for computation than the actual problem. So, here you have to minimize a function f x and that f x is given as
So, it is x. So, there are so means this way x variable is partitioned now into x 1, x 2, x k right and x k belongs to R of n k and n 1 n k is capital N. Basically, I am partitioning this vector into several blocks, each, each block here is a vector. So, this is in R n 1 and this is in R n capital K, this is capital K. So, once uh, this is known, let me now just write down the inequality constant. So, this is a problem in a decomposed form. Now, once you have this in a decomposed form, then what is your Lagrangian? Maybe I can put this to be 0, B i to be 0. So, this is where you will see a very good usefulness of Lagrangian duality. So, what would be a Lagrangian here? Your Lagrangian would be this would be a Lagrangian. Now, if you want to find the theta lambda, this can be now written as minimum or x of course. Now, you see here I have now got to solve some small or simpler optimization problem, but if I solve one of these optimization problems the structure of the other is clear what would be the solution. So, I have to solve a very simple optimization problem at a much lower dimension than n and if it is just an unconstant problem now. I can just for a fixed lambda, I can actually really solve this problem much more easily. So, here you see there is a use of actually looking at the Lagrangian dual because computation of theta lambda is quite simple. 
I would give you as a homework as to what would happen if I put a bi here. So, if I put a bi here instead of 0, so how what, what would be the writing? Here also you will have you will have the additional term minus b lambda. You do this and then from the whole thing subtract minus b lambda. But uh, let me just give you a problem. A problem in a decomposed form, which is specially used in uh, the study of power supply in in electrical engineering, where this problem actually comes out of study of power demand in the sense that how can we satisfy the demand of power at minimal cost. So, if x j is the amount of power the j th power plant is. So, there are n power plants 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. If the j th power plant well what should be the output of the j th power plant. So, that the demand is met. So, so demand is B say then the total amount of output of all the n power plant should be excess of B that is the meaning that the demand is satisfied. So, suppose the cost of generating electricity at the j th power plant it does not matter whether you put this or that you just here. So, if this is the cost usually the cost is a quadratic cost. and B is the total demand. So, if x j is output of the to have an output x j from the j th plant this is the total cost that you have to incur. So, here it is strictly convex of course, suppose I say that they can make x j is free any amount of j they can produce just theoretically actually x j should have a bound. Then this problem is to minimize summation f j x j and if b is a total demand then summation j equal to 1 to n. That is what it should be. So, it is again a problem in the decomposed form and for which you can actually use the Lagrangian duality to get something. It is very very important to note that optimization is a very very vast field. It is not that what we have done is a broad gamut of optimization it is just a minuscule gamut possibly. Optimization is not our what we have done is called continuous optimization. We have not spoken about variables that could be discrete that is for example, you could minimize an objective function f x where x i either takes the value 0 or 1. So, for example, I just give you a simple problem like this or just a linear programming problem. switching. So, x i takes the value either 0 or 1. So, these sort of problems are called integer programming problems and we have not discussed them at all here. Our x is always in R n rather than x being in the Cartesian product of. So, here x would be in the Cartesian product of n fold Cartesian product of 0 1. So, 0 1 to which is which is also customarily written as. So, it is a sort of hyper cube. So, if you are if you are in 2 D then 0 1 0 1. So, it is 
this point, this point, this point a grid basically. So, these are the four points over which you need to compute the function values and list down the minimum. If it is only your four points like this, right, that is n equal to 2, then it is very simple, just calculate the four points and get it. A machine will give you all the answer in a blink of an eye. The problem is that what happens when n is very, very large? And when n is very large, things can be very difficult, you cannot make a total enumeration. So, because you cannot make a total enumeration, you must have clever ways to know which among this huge number of finite points is actually giving is the minimum. So, that gives rise to a subject called integer programming or combinatorial optimization, because it uses methods from combinatorics and its approaches is completely different from the approach that we have taken in this course an approach of continuous optimization. I want to assert you at this stage that we are going to fulfill a part of this thing in this course, because after apart from the lectures that I have, there will be two special lectures added to this course and those are delivered by Professor Vishnu Narayanan of the Industrial Engineering and Operations Research Department of IIT Mumbai. And you would see that the course that I, the approach taken for such problems where you have discrete variables or integer variables are absolutely different from the approaches that we take have taken here. There the approaches depend on combinatorics, it depends on graph theory, while here the approaches approach is largely depending on analysis. There is also an, another important class of optimization problem which is currently a very hot area of research is called polynomial optimization. Of course, it depends on analysis, but it also depends heavily on algebra and algebraic geometry. So, these are certain exciting things that are come coming in and what we have not done here is that we have not here spoken about what happens when a data has got noise, because most engineering problems during collection of data there are certain noise which comes into the problem automatically nobody can stop that, that noise will come in. So, once that noise comes in, you need to know from your empirical experience that what sort of a distribution that noise might follow. And once that is known, you can develop certain optimization techniques to handle the problem with that noise. Those sort of things are called stochastic optimization or there is a part of it called probabilistic programming which we have not done here, it is called stochastic optimization. So, as we try to finish this course, we see that we have done a huge gamut of stuff which is the foundations of optimization but largely on continuous optimization, we have not spoken anything about discrete optimization of which you will have listened in the two lectures. But I would also like to assert that lot of problems of discrete optimization can have a corresponding problem in the continuous optimization setup, which is some sort of an approximation to it. So, we can relax or in some way approximate this problem. Uh, by a continuous optimization problem and immediately estimate the solution. For example, in this particular case of 4, we can relax this problem by taking the minimization over the convex hull of these 4 points. So, I can do the same thing, I can relax this problem what I have done here and write minimum of this over
So, that is a relaxation over the convex hull of. Now, it is very very difficult to do the compute the convex hull in the machine. If that could have been done, then integer programming would have been much easier. Because that cannot be done, there has to be different ways, and that is whole lot of an exciting subject which we are not going to get into. So, with this, I uh, would like to. So, here now we are ending this course. I would like to thank you for patiently listening to this. I hope I have not made uh, some mistakes which could be unintentional. If you go through the course, please uh, write back to me in my email. So, that that can be corrected and a corrected uh, update can be posted on the website of this course which would be maintained by NPTEL at IIT Madras. So, thank you once again and I hope some of you who has listened to this course or some of you would need optimization problems will make a deeper study of optimization and understand the subject better. Thank you very much.